here and then I give you the sign, okay, Teisa? Okay. Okay, you can go. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Thaisa Stork Bergman, and we are now uh, receiving Dr. Michael Heraclius from the University of uh, Pennsylvania, Penn State University. It's our honor to receive Mike, a previous collaborator of mine, and maybe we continue to collaborate in the future. Uh, Mike received his PhD in 1992 from Columbia University, where he worked on Julius Halpern um, looking for quasars with double peaked emission lines. And I know Mike from that time because I discovered the double peaked line in NGC 1097, and I went to look for people working on this um, type of study, and I found Mike <laughs> in the internet. Uh, then Mike did a postdoc at the Space Telescope Science Institute between 92 and 95, working with Keith Horn and Mario Livio on AGM, Active Galactic Nuclei. Uh, he was uh, also later a Hubble Fellow at Berkeley from 95 to 98, working with Alex Filipenko on AGM, in particular, in particular with liners and also with cataclysmic variables, stars. Um, Present day, uh, Mark, uh, Mike is interested mostly in the physics of the Broline region, which is actually still, you know, the, the double peak lines are from the uh, inner part of the Broline region. And he's the co-chair of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, survey uh, number five that will begin maybe next year, or oh, it's already beginning. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, as yes, SDSS four is finishing, yeah. uh, and uh, he's the co-chair of the Quasar Physics Working Group. So he's also interested in, in gravitational wave sources, uh, science uh, for supermassive black holes. And we all know that uh, we need a, a new interferometer to to receive the sign of, from uh, gravitational wave from supermassive black holes, and this will be LISA laser interfer interferometry in the space. And this is going to happen in the uh, 2030s. And Mike is part of this uh, group uh, advising for the construction and operation of LISA. So welcome, uh, Mike, and you can begin your talk. Uh, thanks Thank for you. accepting our invitation. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure uh, to give this talk. It's great to see Thaisa again and uh, communicate uh, at least by video. Um, and I also see some other names in the audience that I recognize. Um, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so this talk is, um, is going to be uh, broken up in approximately two parts. Uh, the first part describes uh, my own work on the variability of uh, emission lines from quasars. And a lot of that work was done in collaboration with Thaisa and you'll see her name in some places on my slides. Um, I will begin that part with a long introduction to explain um, what is going on, the physical system and how we try to extract information about what's going on. And then the second part of the talk uh, will be an introduction to SDSS-5. And I will tell you a little bit about the design of one survey that's part of SDSS-5 that is uh, aimed at studying quasar variability. And that's the survey that I'm most closely connected with. Okay. So when I was a student, um, quasars were considered unusual examples uh, of galaxies that had a supermassive black hole in the center. And that black hole was accreting gas from the um, surrounding uh, galaxy and shining by the power that was released by the accretion. But today we, we think of quasars in a very different way. We've learned in time that most massive galaxies have a supermassive black hole. Um, and we now consider that black hole to be a very important ingredient a very important component in the evolution of the host galaxy because it exercises feedback of energy and momentum onto the host. Um, I will talk a little bit about that um, in, in the first 
part of the talk. But we also know that quasars contribute to the heating and ionization of the intergalactic medium through photons and through outflows. Uh, their jets can uh, impart a lot of energy in the intracluster medium and keep it hot. Um, and we can also use them as tools. And we can do at least two things using quasars as tools. They're background sources. And when we observe them spectroscopically, we see absorption lines from the intervening gas. And those can be absorption lines from the intergalactic medium or from intervening galaxy, uh, galaxies. And we can use that method of studying the absorption lines to learn about the composition and the properties of the intervening gas. And since uh, they host supermassive black holes, we try to learn about the properties of the black holes from studying the quasars. And, and from there, we try to track the evolution of the black holes as a function of uh, cosmic time and their connection to the evolution of the host galaxy, the coevolution of the quasar and the black hole. So they've come a long way way since I started studying them. It became from strange examples and unusual examples. They became pretty standard uh, objects um, whose role we understand a lot better, and they are very useful in many aspects of um, astrophysics. Um, and still we need, uh, we have some way to go to understand their, uh, how exactly they work, and it's necessary to do that so that we can use them better as tools and understand uh, in more detail how they function um, as agents of galaxy evolution. So a lot of what we learn about quasars is based on spectroscopy. And the reason is because the, the regions around the supermassive black hole are extremely compact and they're, very, they're impossible to resolve, resolve spatially. So we use the spectrum and its variability as um, substitutes for resolving spatially the structure of the quasar. So what you see here is an example, a typical example of a, the spectrum of a quasar. I have shifted it to the rest frame and I marked some of the strong emission lines. And you see that the emission lines are marked in two different colors. The red, the red labels represent lines that are permitted transitions of hydrogen and helium in this case, uh, and they, they uh, are also broad. I'll show you in the next slide how broad they are. And you also see some sharp emission lines. Those are a lot narrower. And they are marked with red, with green colors. And they represent forbidden transitions uh, that are essentially collisionally excited. Um, in, and they, they de-excite uh, radiated. So let's zoom in. Can you see my cursor? I presume you can see my cursor. Let's zoom in on this piece of the spectrum. Yes, we can see. Okay, right here. Uh, so you can see a better view, two different quasars here. And if you if you look at H beta and oxygen three, you can now see the big contrast between the widths of those lines. The Balmer lines of hydrogen and the helium lines, uh, they're basically recombination lines. Their widths are several thousand kilometers per second. Uh, and the forbidden lines, uh, have widths less than a thousand kilometers per second, typically a few hundred kilometers per second. Um, so the properties of the spectrum and this big contrast between the properties of the emission lines uh, have led us, uh, have led to the early development of a picture that describes the gas that is uh, in the immediate vicinity of the black hole. So we drew cartoons like these. And in the center, you can see I put a black box which we called uh, the central engine. That's where all the power is produced. It comes out in the form of ionizing photons. Uh, and the photons ionize two gas systems that are surrounding the black hole. The, the system that I colored red is gas that's very close to the black hole. It's bound gravitationally to the black hole and it moves very fast. The, the bulk speed is about a few thousand kilometers per second. And that explains the widths of the permitted lines uh, that we observe. Um, this gas is also very dense. And because of its high density, it can only emit uh, permitted lines because the forbidden lines are collisionally de-excited. Uh, if, if we, uh, the, size, the size scale of the system is about 10 to the minus two parsec. If we move a little further out to uh, size scales of about one to 10 parsecs, we find another uh, gaseous system, which is colored in green, that is moving, of course, more slowly, a few hundred kilometers per second, it has a much lower density, which allows permitted lines uh, to de-excite 
radiatively, and that is what we call the narrow line region, where the narrow lines are produced. And of course, the red gas that produces the broad lines is called the broad line region. So that is the phenomenology that most people uh, have heard about and the general explanation. And it's a, it's a very vague explanation. And I'll get into more refined versions and more details uh, as I go on in the talk. So let's get serious a little bit. Let's ask what is inside the black box, okay? Inside the black box is a machine that uh, produces the ionizing radiation. And this particular machine, as I drew it here, is made by Mitsubishi. It has a power of 10 to the 37 horsepower, and we call it the Quasar Central Engine. Its main function is to accrete gas. It takes gas in from the host galaxy, uh, in which the host galaxy can somehow funnel uh, to the center. Um, it processes the gas and it emits energetic photons that photoionize um, gas in the near the nucleus, but also it, it collimates relativistic jets that spread out even beyond uh, the size scale of the, of the host galaxy and they can interact with the intracluster medium outside. Uh, from various observational uh, campaigns and other indicators, we can uh, infer a lot of the properties, phenomenological properties of this engine. From variability studies, we know that the, that the size is uh, a few light hours. That is the variability time scale of the X-ray source. Um, and that corresponds to tens to hundreds, to hundreds of astronomical units, very compact. The mass of the central object, the black hole presumably, can range from 10 to the six to 10 to the nine solar masses. Uh, the luminosity um, also comes in a very wide range, but the most uh, luminous, the most powerful quasars that we observe, usually at high redshift, uh, they have luminosities up to 10 to the 47 uh, ergs per second. So that would be 10 to the 14 solar luminosities. And they can outshine uh, their host galaxies by a lot. And if we now do a little bit of simple arithmetic and we ask how much accretion uh, rate does the black hole need in order to produce the observed power, we come up to accretion rates of order uh, several solar masses per year. That's the maximum for the most luminous quasars. And they can drop by many orders of magnitude for low luminosity quasars. Okay. Now, thinking more physically about the central engine. Um, the mechanism by which the power is generated uh, involves this uh, gaseous structure that we call an accretion disk. And I drew an artist's impression of a disk here. And this one is colored in a physically meaningful way. You see that it is hotter in the middle and it gets uh, redder and therefore a little cooler as you go out. Um, the general idea was developed in the 60s and the 70s and applied to accretion in compact binary stars, neutron stars or black holes that are accreting gas from a, from a companion. But the same theory uh, apply in, in general, at least uh, in general terms, applies to quasars. So here is the basic idea. Um, the, gas in the, the gas comes from the outside and settles into this uh, equatorial disk that, that, that is uh, in the equatorial plane um, of the black hole. And it swirls and migrates in the radial direction very slowly. Most of the motion is in the azimuthal direction. Um, and as the gas uh, rotates, um, it follows Kepler's laws more or less. It's supported by hydrostatic pressure in the vertical direction and it's thin, and it's supported rotationally in the, in the plane of the disk. So if you think about two rings, two rings close to each other near the, uh, in the plane of the disk, uh, they would rotate differentially. They're at slightly different radii from the center. So their angular speed and their, radial and their tangential speed is a little different. But because they're moving at different speeds, then they effectively wrap against each other. So if there was a mechanism to provide the equivalent of viscosity, then the differential rotation combined with the viscosity will lead to, would lead to a torque and an energy and energy dissipation. So the torque transmits angular momentum from the inner parts of the disk to the outer parts. So the gas 
in the inner ring loses a little bit of, of its angular momentum and is able to shift a little closer to the center. And the angular momentum is uh, transported in, in a series of very small steps all the way out. So a little bit of gas at the outer end will collect a lot of the angular momentum and expand, but most of the gas in the inner parts of the disk will flow radially inwards slowly. Um, and the energy dissipation, um, it happens uh, everywhere in the disk. And the, we assume now at least that the, the energy is radiated locally at the, at the place where it's released. So the disk can then uh, accomplish two things. It transports angular momentum outwards, which allows the gas to accrete. And it converts gravitational potential energy to heat, which is then radiated. And that's how we observe, uh, we can see the accretion process. Um, what we understand today from a lot of uh, detailed numerical simulations of the accretion flow is that the, this property that I call magic viscosity is really magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. Um, the, the rings are connected by magnetic field lines. As the rings rotate differentially, they stretch the lines, the lines snap, and they, they produce reconnection effectively. And uh, the nonlinear version of the process leads to turbulence. And the turbulent gas, um, moves the, the gas the gas with high specific angular momentum moves slowly outwards and that's how angular momentum is transported uh, outwards the original version of the theory is by Shakur and Sanyaev from the from the early 70s okay the other thing that we observe is um, absorption lines from um, resonance transitions and uh, from those, those lines are blue shifted, just like the, uh, just like we observe P signy lines from hot stars, and we infer that there is a wind from the stars. The same observations um, tell us uh, that we see a wind that's coming off the accretion disk um, of quasars. So on the right here, you see a sequence of spectra. Now these are the ultraviolet spectra. The strongest emission lines are, are labeled. There's a carbon-4 emission line right here. Lyman alpha is at the left end. But if you look at the bottom spectrum that's colored in light blue, you see a lot of absorption lines. There's absorption from aluminum-3. There's a deep absorption trough from carbon-4. At the red end of the spectrum, there's a magnesium-2 emission line. And that produces absorption as well. And there's absorption from Lyman alpha that is off the left end of the plot here. And the general, uh, the general variation of the spectra, you see some spectra show no absorption at all. And uh, other spectra show progressively deeper and deeper absorption lines. And the interpretation is that if we look, uh, is, uh, sorry, the interpretation is that the wind is not emitted spherically. The system does not have spherical symmetry, it has cylindrical symmetry. And the wind uh, is, uh, is accelerated and it's contained close to it, the equatorial plane of the disk. So it moves um, up from the disk and then it bends away. And I'll show you more exact figures in a second. But it also remembers its rotational motion. Uh, so it's an ever expanding spiral that is close to the plane of the disk. So if we see, if we, if, we, if we as observers are looking from an angle that's close to the axis of the system, then our line of sight will not intersect a lot of the gas. And we will be able to uh, see the emission lines without any absorption. And as our line of sight goes lower and lower, closer to the plane of the disk, then we intersect with it. It, it intersects with a lot of gas. Excuse me, I have to plug in the power. Uh, it insert, intersects with a lot of gas and the absorption lines get deeper and deeper. And what we observe as a blue shift of the line is really an expression of the outflow of the, of the gas in the wind. Okay, so these winds are thought to be the way by which the quasar influences its host galaxy. We think they're very common from various statistical studies of large samples. Uh, we detect absorption lines in 30 to 50% of active galaxies and quasars. We detect them in the ultraviolet where the strong 
um, resonance transitions are, but we also detect them in the X-rays. So that tells us that the gas has multiple phases. There's a hot phase that's probably very close to the black hole where most of the uh, power is released and where the temperatures are the highest. And then as the gas moves outwards, it might cool and recombine a little bit and we might see um, absorption lines from lower ionization phases uh, at larger forming at larger distances from the center. Now, what is impressive is the velocities. The outflow velocities can be can easily be 10 to 20% of the speed of light. Uh, and in some uh, examples of uh, high redshift quasars, we've measured velocities even higher than this, up to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 times the speed of light. Uh, we've also uh, detected large-scale molecular, molecular gas outflows uh, by observing um, in the radio and in the, in the sub-millimeter by um, the molecular lines um, from CO and OH. And those outflows are a lot slower, but they still carry away a lot of mass. Uh, the mass outflow rate uh, detected in this way can be hundreds of solar masses per year. And most of that mass is coming from the host galaxy. But the power to push it out is coming from the very fast outflow that is generated at the center. And this ratio that I wrote here uh, is the ratio of the kinetic power of the outflow, so the kinetic energy per unit time in the outflow, divided by the accretion luminosity. This is the power produced in the form of photons by the accretion flow. And that is somewhere between a few percent and 10 percent. And that is a very interesting number because uh, models of galaxy evolution that try to combine this outflow with star formation and other processes in the host galaxy find that uh, if we tap a few percent of the power of the quasar and manage to transfer it into uh, heating and kinetic energy of the gas in the interstellar medium of the galaxy, then that will have a profound effect on star formation. It will heat up the gas uh, enough to slow down and maybe stop star formation completely, and it will expel a big part of the gas. And various models that try to represent this process, they find that there is an adiabatic expansion of the outflow from the center. It goes into the host galaxy. It shocks the interstellar medium. It sweeps it up and eventually throws it out of the galaxy altogether. And these models are now very popular in uh, the galaxy evolution simulations because they accomplish a few very useful effects. They allow um, for star formation to, to stop prematurely at some high redshift. It allows for growth of the black hole. And it also suggests coordination between the growth of the black hole and the growth of the stellar mass in the host galaxy. So when galaxies merge, if we have time at the end, by the way, you can ask them to show you a movie. I'm not showing it now to save a little bit of time. Uh, when two galaxies merge, a lot of the gas goes into forming stars. Another portion of the gas goes into the black hole at the center. It activates the black hole. Then it triggers an outflow, which then stops star formation and expels the gas. So it's, this is like a self-limiting, self-regulating mechanism that makes sure that the growth of the black hole and the growth of the stellar mass are coordinated and uh, neither one grows at a very high um, at a very high rate so that is the story that's how quasars fit into the bigger picture of galaxy evolution now what about the broadline region what's so interesting about it um, it's interesting phenomenologically because it is a hallmark of quasars we recognize quasars because they have broad emission lines in their spectrum. Um, but we also observe that those broad emission lines, um, the properties of the broad emission lines are related to uh, general properties of the quasar. And we use them as tools. And among other things, we measure the mass of the black hole using the behavior of the lines. So what's going on in the broad line region? Let's go back now and take this picture uh, that was vague and very qualitative and try to um, develop it into a useful physical model. Um, the, the original view that was uh, 
a very simple picture was the way it, it described the system, the way I drew the cartoon. There were discrete clouds of gas units that would orbit as units around the central black hole. Uh, and the ionizing radiation would hit the face of every cloud. Uh, the photons would penetrate to some depth, ionize the gas and produce uh, the emission lines. Um, however, even back when this in the 70s and 80s, when this picture was developed, it was recognized that uh, there were unsolved problems uh, with this picture. First of all, the clouds could not exist as discrete units with sharp edges. They would expand at the speed of sound and they would diffuse into a, a continuous medium. And it was a very, very difficult uh, theoretical problem. How do you make the clouds uh, maintain um, their shapes? Um, another, another observational constraint that uh, turned out to be extremely serious um, is that the profiles of the emission lines are very smooth. And they suggest that the medium that produces the emission lines cannot be uh, a, a collection of discrete clouds. It has to be a continuous medium to produce the smooth profiles. So the combination of these two arguments plus a number of others uh, leads us today to think that the cloud picture is inadequate. And we are thinking in terms of more sophisticated physical models. And those models are also connected to the shape, to the to the picture that I was just discussing about the accretion disk. Okay, one of the observational tools that has helped us a lot in uh, developing the picture and testing it is um, an observation is a process called reverberation mapping. Okay, so watch what happens to the cartoon now when a pulse is emitted. So some flare in the central engine is emitted at the very center right here and what should propagate through uh, this region, the whole broad line region at the speed of light. Here it is. There's a, a light front, a light, uh, yeah, a light front that propagates outwards. And after some short delay, it reaches the broad line region and it causes the lines to respond. Okay. And here's an example of how we do the observations. Uh, looking at this, um, at these two light curves, the top light curve is the, is the continuum. And I drew the fiducial marker here at this time. And you see that there's a peak in the continuum. The light curve below shows you the corresponding light, uh, the corresponding um, intensity of the H beta emission line. And you see that the peak is offset a little bit. So there's a little bit of a delay in the response of H beta. And that represents some, in some average sense, the light travel time between the source of the continuum, the central engine, and the broad line region. Um, so right there from this simple observation, we can get a sense of scale. If we combine it with other information, such as the widths of the lines, we can get, we can get constraints on the dynamics of the gas. And th those leads to, lead to estimates of the mass of the black hole. So with campaigns like these, we can actually measure the mass of the, of the black hole by combining a lot of the information. Here's a, a little more data on the same object. Now there's a lot of emission lines plotted. And those of you who have good eyes and can see uh, or are wearing your glasses and you can uh, compare the different peaks you can see that Lyman alpha has a longer lag than silicon four and carbon four and helium two. So what we are learning from these types of observations is that different lines respond with a different delay. And that delay uh, depends very much on the ionization of the gas. So we've learned from these campaigns that the gas is stratified in ionization. Uh, so higher ionization near the center, lower ionization further out. And that tells us, that confirms beyond doubt that the gas in the broadline region is photoionized, this combination of observations. Um, another observation that uh, is extremely telling is that the widths of the lines change as the luminosity fluctuates. So when the line is very luminous, 
the width is small. And when the line luminosity drops, the width gets wider. And that's because when the luminosity is high, the region that participates in the line emission is much bigger. Let me try to go back. So the line emission would be coming from a bigger portion of the broad line region where the velocities start to get lower and therefore the line is narrower. And when you make the line, uh, when, you make, and you, when you decrease the luminosity, the part of the broad line region that is participating uh, vigorously in the line emission is the inner part where the velocities are higher and then the line gets wider. Okay, so from all these, from all these observations and more, uh, we can now draw uh, and describe a more uh, sophisticated picture of the broad line region. And that's described in this cartoon right here. So we associate the broad line region with the upper layers of the accretion disk. And the part of the accretion disk that is um, responsible for emitting the lines um, starts at about 100 gravitational radii, maybe 10 to the minus 3 parsec. In the middle of the broad line region, ballpark, uh, way, a way to keep a few numbers to keep in mind is that the radial extent for a quasar with a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole and a luminosity of about 10 to the 45 ergs per second, um, that radial extent is about 10 to the minus two parsec. The light crossing time is about a month, and that corresponds roughly to the delay between the fluctuations of the continuum and the corresponding fluctuations in the emission lines. And then the dynamical time, <coughs> excuse me, the dynamical time is several years, up to six years. So if we want to study the response of the gas to fluctuations in the continuum, we need campaigns that can resolve this one month time scale. If we want to study how the gas redistributes itself, or if uh, um, phenomena that are characteristic of fluid disks develop uh, and evolve in the broad line region, then, this is, then the six year time scale is what we should have in mind. And we should be trying to resolve that, that kind of time scale. And these ideas, uh, keep them in mind, and I'll come back to them uh, later. OK, so here's a couple of physical uh, models for the broadline region that um, tell us how uh, the gas, uh, how the gas is structured, what is its kinematic state, etc. So this is this cartoon describes a radiatively accelerated wind. So you see the streamlines in black arrows and this gray uh, layer at the top of the of the disk is the region, the part of the disk where the gas emits the broad lines. Oops. I went in the wrong direction. So uh, thermal pressure or local radiation pressure will make this layer thick and raise it above the plane of the disk. That by, by, by becoming vertically extended, the gas now can see photons that come from the center of the disk uh, where the luminosity is extremely high. And those photons will, will exert radiation pressure and push the gas along those streamlines. And that's how you produce a wind that stays near the plane of the disk. And that wind moves radially outwards along those black streamlines, but it also rotates. Here's a more sophisticated simulation of the same process. And now you see that the wind is filamentary. Uh, the, color, the color map, excuse me, the color map shows you uh, a density scale and the arrows show you the velocity. So you see that there are dense filaments in the wind and in between the filaments, there are uh, regions of much lower density. And this kind of structure is actually very helpful because it allows for a wide range of ionization in the gas. The denser gas is less ionized than the low density gas. And the broad emission lines that come from a wide range of ionized species can now be produced in the same region since different ionization states can coexist. You see very low density in the polar direction uh, where the gas doesn't, where we don't have very dense gas. So this is one idea where radiation pressure uh, does all the work. 
And it's in fact, it's radiation pressure on ions uh, that retain at least some of their electrons. Here's a different idea or somewhat different idea. Um, in this case, the disk is dusty. So the, in this model, the dust is allowed to exist in regions of the disk where the temperature is low enough below the sublimation temperature. So local radiation pressure in the vertical direction uh, acts on the dust and it causes the disc to be inflated. So it pushes the disc to some thickness. Um, so you see the, the blue shaded face of the disc re here receives the ionizing photons from the center. And that's what uh, the broadline region, that's where the broadline re region is. And then as you go further and further out, uh, the conditions in the gas still allow for line emission, but once you get there really too far out, uh, the region is so dusty that any, li any lines that are emitted will never get out because they're, they will be absorbed by dust. We can take a, uh, so this is a static model, um, but we can look at a dynamic model. And now you see trajectories of the fluid elements. Uh, the blue ones are trajectories where the dust remains dusty and it can receive a lot of radiation pressure from the center and it can go out in long arcs. Um, the, the red gas, the red lines show you gas where the dust is destroyed and then it falls back. So there is circulation and tur turbulence in this upper layer of the disk uh, and a wide range of ionizations again. Okay, so this is the general picture. So in the grand scheme of things, and with these models in mind, uh, the base of the large-scale outflow, the upper layers of the disk, are the broadline region. That's where the lines are formed. And it's a very interesting region to study because whatever we learn about the conditions in that region tells us about launching mechanisms of the outflow. And specifically, just to set up where, where I'm going next, if the outflow um, is... Um, Sorry, if there is time dependent behavior in the structure of the disk and its atmosphere, that will influence the stability of the outflow. So those are all things that we want to study. And the way we do it is by observing the broad emission lines and the, their variability. So let me give you here a very quick uh, summary of uh, which emission lines are of interest in this case. So let's think about a rotating disk. We're the observer at the bottom and we see the disk rotating. One side of the disk on the left is approaching us. The other is uh, receding from us. So there are blue shifts and red shifts of a line that is emitted from all over the disk. We can um, do a simple calculation where we assign an emissivity and we break up the disk into cells and we try to synthesize the line profile from this rotating system. And you see that we get a double peaked profile. The side of the disk that's approaching produces the blue shifted part of the line and the side of the disk that's receding produces the red shifted part of the line. Okay. Um, do we observe such emission lines from quasars? If we do, then, then they're extremely useful because they probe the, the surface of the disk and they can tell us a lot about what's going on in the disk itself. And indeed we do, they're not common. Uh, they are found in about uh, five to 10% of all quasars. And here are a couple of examples. So what you should be concentrating on are these two peaks. Here's one of the two peaks and here's the other. You see a lot of narrow lines, which you should ignore. They're coming from the narrow line region and they, and they are contaminants for our purposes. In 3C390.3, you see the two peaks clearly. There's one and there's the other. Can we make models to fit these line profiles and confirm that our hypothesis is on the right track? Um, before we get to the models, let me tell you a few things about what we can learn without even fitting models. Uh, the widths are extremely high, 12,000 kilometers per second. Um, and that tells us that the distance in the, from the center where they're produced is about 500 gravitational radii, maybe 10 to the minus three parsec. Okay. And now we can make the models and superpose them on the data. And you see that the mod, unlike the 
cartoon that I showed you two slides ago, these models that are shown as red lines here, they are asymmetric. And the asymmetries come from relativistic effects. Um, there is a relativistic beaming, the side of the disk that's approaching the observer beams in the direction of the observer. So the blue peak is a little stronger. And then there's a, a gravitational redshift from being very close to the black hole. So that gives us a net redshift and a red wing on the line right here. And these effects uh, produce the asymmetry that we observe. And they also allow us to determine the inclination of the disk. So it, it, he, these two are good examples of how well the model uh, can fit the data. Uh, the other thing that we've observed uh, after following these objects for many years is that they're not steady. The profiles change with time. And the way we try to interpret the, uh, the observations is again by modifying the models. So we start with a model of a nice circular axisymmetric disk, but we allow it to have a spiral arm. Okay. So this spiral arm will, could be the result of a genes instability. If the disk is massive and self-gravitating, it can launch waves going inwards, which then wrap around as the disk uh, material rotates. Another possibility is some passing massive object can perturb the disk and raise a tide effectively and cause the disk to produce non-axisymmetric non structures. So with this simple model, we can calculate the axisymmetric line profile, which you see on the top, on the figure on the right. But then we, you can see the perturbation, the extra emission, uh, and how that emission moves around as the spiral alarm processes. So we allow the spiral alarm to execute a complete revolution. And you see a series of line profiles at different steps in that revolution. And of course, the bright arm changes its azimuth, it changes its radial velocity, and that's how the perturbation moves around the profile. Okay. So let's compare this to the data. So this is a and the object that Thaisa mentioned in her introduction, this is NGC 1097, a nearby Seifert galaxy. And you see a sequence of observations going from 1991 all the way to 2000, sorry, to 2001. So over the course of 10 years, the biggest, most obvious change in the profile is that the two peaks have changed their relative sizes, their relative heights. And and that's because the perturbation from us in the context of this model, the perturbation from the spiral arm has traveled one revolution around the disk. And you see that in, in 1991, the red side was stronger. By 1996, the blue side got stronger. Then the, the pattern reversed again and again. So over 10 years, we probably observed two or three revolutions which corresponds to a dynamical time of uh, a few years. And it's in qualitative agreement with the estimates that we have based on the mass of the black hole and the size of the broad line region. So this is fairly encouraging uh, for this model. Uh, there are many other examples where we've done the same exercise. And this kind of behavior is easy to spot if you observe an object for many years, but it takes a lot of patience uh, to follow it and um, some effort to make the models. Here's an example in this, in this figure, you see an example of where we caught the perturbation growing. And this happens over the course of a few years. That's shorter than the dynamical time. The growth rate of the instability that causes the arm is pretty fast. Um, and after this, we would expect the arm to process and the perturbation to travel to the other side of the profile. Now, going beyond, uh, let me go back here, going beyond this type of uh, obvious perturbation, we've done another type of study where we take the line profile and we slice it into bins in velocity. So for every slice, we create a radial, uh, sorry, a light curve. So we essentially map the fluctuations in intensity as a function of velocity in different parts of the profile. So from that time series, we calculate a Fourier transform. And uh, that's what you see here. Every horizontal row here is one bin in velocity. And 
you see the frequency resulting from the Fourier transform. So we can get um, a Fourier transform as a function of wavelength in the line profile. And if we collapse everything into uh, one axis, the total power summed over all wavelengths is a power law. And we can make models to interpret uh, this behavior. So here are the three kinds of models that we tried. We put spots in the disk. And as the spots move around, uh, their perturbation, their local perturbation translates into uh, changes in the line profile locally in one small slice. We tried three different models. Here in the first one, the spots are just persistent. Uh, in the middle one, the spots come and go. They fade and then they reappear. And you can see that in the movie. And then in the third case, we allow them uh, to stretch because of differential rotation. So the spots stretch, they fade, then a new one appears and it stretches and it fades again. And by comparing the power spectra of these mod produced by these models with the observed ones, we conclude that um, the, uh, the best picture is that of um, self-gravitating clumps, this one right here. All right, so the lessons. The modern models do a good job in explaining the variability patterns and the shapes of the profiles of some objects. And if we believe the models, then the disks are massive and self-gravitating, genes unstable, at least locally. And this is progress, but there's a lot of questions to be answered. One big question is what is the connection between double peak and single peak profiles? We've only studied 10% of the line profiles. And can we extend all the lessons to the general AGN population? That is a big question. And we hope that we can address that question with SDSS-5. So SDSS-5 is an extension of SDSS-4, now with two telescopes, one in the Northern Hemisphere and one in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, one in Apache Point and one in uh, Las Campanas. It has three components. The Milky Way mapper is the continuation of infrared spectroscopy <clears throat> of stars. The local volume mapper is IFU spectroscopy of the Milky Way and its nearest neighbors. And the black hole mapper is spectroscopy of quasars. It's, a, it's variability of quasars and also identification of X-ray sources. Up until now, so the handover happened in October of last year. SDSS-4 ended in July, SDSS-5 began in October. Uh, because of COVID, there was a delay in the, in the handover. For the first year of SDSS-5, the observations were done with fibers uh, in plug plates. So you see here this picture of a big aluminum plate that goes in the focal plane of the spectrograph, and there are people who work during the day to plug all the fibers. Um, about a thousand fibers per plate, seven square degrees. Um, now, um, as, of, um, as of August of this year, the observation stopped and we are switching, we're working on switching the instrument. The new instrument for the black hole mapper is, has a robotic fiber positioning system. So you see here an example. So each one of these uh, axes is a robot that can move around each robot has its area uh, where it can move. It's one of these holes. So the whole array of robots has many moving fibers, so it can acquire targets in the area accessible by each fiber. And on the right, you see the whole system in the lab at Ohio State University just before, um, I think this was last summer, just before they uh, started making final tests. Uh, as far as I know, 10 days ago, the whole system was shipped to um, Apache Point Observatory and they will now begin integration. So we're hoping that, that by the end of this calendar year, we will go to the next, second phase of SDSS-5 and we'll be able to make observations uh, with um, the robotic system. And then the team that installed it will go to Las Campanas Observatory and install a, a, a twin unit there so that observations can begin in the south. And this is the instrument that's being used for black hole mapper. Okay, Thais, I see you. Are you giving me a time warning? 
you're muted. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so you should okay. wrap up at this point. <laughs> OK. okay. I will skip a few things. Uh, very quickly, the uh, survey that I'm most interested in is called the ACMIS survey, all quasar multi-epoch spectroscopy. And it will observe 22,000 quasars, all of them bright, and they've all been previously observed. 20,000 will be observed twice over two years, yeah, with intervals of two years. And then 2,000 will be observed 10 times. Uh, with intervals of three or four months. And these will be combined with the existing observations. So if you look at the figure on the right, this is a distribution of all the time intervals, separations between observations uh, as a function of luminosity. So we will cover several magnitudes in luminosity and time intervals between 100 days, about three months and 20 years. And we will sample all of those time intervals very well so we can then construct structure functions, which I skip. I don't have any results to show you, but in 30 seconds or less, I'll give you the highlights of what we expect to detect because we found such examples in STSS4. Variability of the line profiles. Over a time of 10 years, the intensity and shape of the line profiles can change dramatically. Uh, we expect to find uh, changes in the broad absorption lines that tell us about the structure of the wind. You can see a shift in the broad absorption line in this case. And the interpretation is that we're catching filaments in the wind that are accelerating out outwards. We can catch big transformations in the quasar central engine as if it turned off. These are called changing look quasars. The blue continuum and the lines disappear on a time scale of maybe a few years. And we are, getting, uh, we are getting ready to capitalize on those observations. There's a lot of work done by a lot of people and we uh, welcome participation by everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I wonder if the movie that you mentioned, maybe it's, uh, it's good to have a register of this movie uh, for, you know. Yeah. So this movie, I got it off the web. It was, it was made by the group at um, Carnegie Mellon University. It comes from a paper that was published in 2005 and it revolu revolutionized the whole idea of galaxy interactions and triggering of, of black holes. So what you see in the movie is the two galaxies before they crash into each other and you see only the gas. And the movie takes maybe a minute and you see the galaxies crash together, you see a shock at the place, let me start it. Do you hear music? Um, you see the galaxies crash into each other and you see the shock. After this pass, uh, you see that the gas in the center of each galaxy is compressed and that triggers star formation and it also feeds the black hole. And at some point, you will see an outflow beginning from each of the black holes because the accretion rate has jumped up by a large amount by the new supply of gas. Here's the outflow. The red gas is heated gas that is outflow. And the heated gas pushes onto the interstellar medium of the host, and it eventually evacuates all of the gas, and it stops everything. The galaxies become passive. So now the two black holes come together in the second pass. They merge. There's another round of accretion. And that's the end of the merger and the end of the quasar phase. So this is only the gas that we are okay. looking at. So all the action is over. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I think uh, now we move to the breakout rooms. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop transmitting on YouTube. So for those people that are watching us on YouTube, so bye. Bye, thank you. You can leave questions uh, on YouTube, I suppose. Yeah, uh, okay.